you know, the, the topic for this evening is trading in uh, uh, volatile markets. It has been a, um, it's been a tough time, I think, for most people uh, over the last couple of weeks and months since, you know, the onset of COVID now almost two years ago, uh, volatility has relatively increased on a sort of continuous basis. Um, so we've had to make some adjustments with that. And then obviously, over the last few weeks, we've seen volatility really sort of creep up again. And generally, you know, higher volatility is synonymous with markets going down. So it's been a difficult time for most, I think, in, in markets. So I'm hoping to be able to give you guys a little bit of guidance uh, and a little bit of insight on some of the things we can do um, to try and mitigate the, uh, the negative effects of volatility. <clears throat> all right. So, um, all right. So let's get going. So things we've already covered in the past in previous Power Hour presentations, um, sort of, you know, starting with daily routines, practical trading setups, uh, how to build strategies, uh, trading psychology, risk management, developing a trading plan, uh, and just a bunch of things that I sort of wish I knew before I started. Uh, most of these presentations are available on our website. Uh, the link is herenia.zera.za slash presentations. Uh, once this one is um, sort of complete within about a week or so, we'll have this presentation up as well, where the slides will be available as well as links to the videos and that kind of stuff. Um, I think one of the more important things to say, there's no really way, and I said in my previous presentation, there's no real uh, easy way of doing trading, particularly if you want to be an active trader. It is hard work. Um, and, you know, if you're looking for a quick, easy money, this is definitely not the place to look for it, right? There are definitely easier ways. Uh, I think, you know, with time, practice, consistency, and a lot of discipline, uh, trading can be something that can, uh, you know, you can make success out of, um, but you have to go in with your eyes open and understand that it's not, um, you know, it's not the easy money that the internet will have us believe it is. In any case, so let's look at the current trading environment as a starting point. So currently markets have been really challenging, as, as I mentioned before, right? Um, so over the last two or so years, markets have been consistently more volatile. Um, this is, you know, for good reason. There are lots of uncertainties around uh, what the future holds. Uh, so inflation, you know, on the back of this massive stimulus programs that basically every central bank around the world have been running uh, over the last two years to try and um, mitigate some of the negative impacts of uh, COVID essentially, uh, I think is starting to backfire a little bit because we've printed so much money that uh, inflation is almost the only result that we can expect from here. Uh, there's also the risk of further impact from COVID-19, more lockdowns. We've seen that happening in China order that's to lock down more people. The, uh, you know, in cities and that kind of thing. So that has an impact on supply chains, which again puts inflation pressure on, uh, as well as, um, you know, causes all sorts of demand shock uh, if effects. And that, of course, creates uncertainty. And this uncertainty is essentially what drives the volatility. Uh, there's also the Russia-Ukraine situation. Uh, it seems as though more countries are starting to get involved. There was some news around Belarus um, sort of being a staging ground. And, um, you know, the US and, and all sorts of NATO countries are sending munitions and all sorts of things. So the big risk here is that a third or fourth country starts to get involved in this, um, in this conflict and that escalates. Obviously, this has also had quite an impact on energy prices as well as the price of wheat and fertilizer. Um, this is really something I think that we have to be very, very careful of, particularly food inflation. I've said it a few times uh, in sort of interviews and stuff that, um, you know, the words food crisis is something that we haven't really heard much of yet, but I think it is definitely something that we will start hearing in future. There are some, I guess, unconfirmed reports that even local farmers uh, are experiencing an increase of 150% in fertilizer prices, uh, which the retailers are not ex willing to pay higher prices for the crops, so farmers are not incentivized to plant. Uh, which will lead to empty shelves and that kind of thing. So uh, food and energy security has been uh, you know, one of the drivers of a massive amount of uncertainty in the market, and that, of course, uh, breeds volatility. Further, we have uh, tightening monetary policy, um, where 
you know, central banks are now forced to start raising interest rates, uh, which will potentially have a negative impact on, on equity prices and that kind of stuff as well. Uh, so it seems that we are headed into this global recession uh, type situation. Uh, I'm trying, you know, very hard not to make a forecast that we're going into recession, but as far as, um, you know, all the indicators that are, are starting to flash, like, look, guys, we are headed for, for difficult times. Um, you know, we've had a period where, you know, I've said you the retail army is buying the dip, right? So that's become a thing where you just buy the dip uh, and retail traders, um, you know, particularly have been using in the US, using lots of call options and that kind of stuff. Um, the question is that, you know, a lot of people buying the dip and then the dip keeps dipping, uh, which causes panic and then that exacerbates further downside and higher volatility. So even though we don't necessarily know what the future holds, we do know that it is, um, it is absolutely a time to be more cautious and very careful in markets, right? Um, a concept that I want to talk about is drawdown. So you know, drawdown is almost this one, this is an inevitable kind of reality of, of interacting with stock markets or trading or even investing. Uh, and, you know, our primary goal as a trader, and I actually wrote about that as uh, uh, on the previous blog uh, that was, I think, posted just a couple of weeks ago on Just One Lab. Um, you know, we have to protect our capital at all costs, even if it means that we miss out on opportunities. Uh, there is always going to be another opportunities, uh, another opportunity coming along. What we have to do is make sure that we have capital um, available to us to deploy when great opportunities come. If we lose, if we miss out on opportunities in the short term, uh, that's okay. Our job is to survive long enough to be able to take the next opportunity, right? So um, I've put a little chart here. I hope you guys can see the cursor. Put a little chart here that shows, you know, how much if you lose 10%, you've got to make like 11% to to get back to where you were. If you lose 50%, you've got to double your account in order to get back to where you were. If you lose 60%, you've got to do 150% return. So these numbers get bigger and bigger as you draw further and further down on your on your initial capital. Um, and sometimes, you know, if you've drawn down a huge amount, recovering becomes extremely difficult. So protecting drawdown uh, during difficult times is essentially just way more important than trying to make money in the market, right? Uh, if you are disciplined in your approach and you manage to control your drawdown, profits essentially become almost inevitable. Um, it's just literally being able to stay in the game long enough uh, to be able to take the opportunities that the market gives to us. So right, let's look at volatility, right? So um, what I've sort of shown here is we can see over you know a, a long period of time, so starting in 2013, Volatility kind of, this is just the, the VIX index, the, the S&P 500 volatility index. And we can see that it would sort of range between this uh, sort of 12 to 24 or 12 to 20 region. And this was uh, sort of standard market volatility. We have some spikes here when the market sort of comes down and makes a correction, but generally volatility was relatively low. Uh, it even sort of came lower into the 20, uh, 2017, 2018 period. And then along came COVID, right? And we had this massive spike in volatility and a very sharp, uh, aggressive sell-off in the S&P 500. And since then, volatility has not managed to base out as low as it was uh, in previous years. So just as a general sort of market regime, uh, volatility has been a lot higher, which does mean we have to change our approach to this, right? Something that I've also been sort of keeping an eye on, uh, and this is data that includes up to yesterday, is the move index versus the VIX index, right? So what the move does is it, read, it basically reads bond market volatility. Uh, we can see here that there's a very high correlation between the move uh, and the VIX. Sometimes they're quite far apart, but generally the VIX tends to follow, uh, you know, the what the move is doing, right? So as move comes down, we see the VIX come down. What we've seen in recent months, um, is that we've seen a big separation between bond volatility and equity volatility. So there's a lot of pressure on the bond market. Uh, people are selling bonds at a furious pace. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff happening, obviously, with interest rates and that kind of stuff as well, which is pushing bond volatility a lot higher. So one of two things has to happen here. Either bond volatility has to decrease extremely rapidly in order to kind of catch up with the VIX, or the VIX has to catch up to the bond volatility index, right? 
Um, if the latter is the case, where we see uh, equity market volatility pick up to catch up to where the, the move volatility is, or bond market volatility is, that implies that we are due for a relatively large scale uh, equity market sell-off. Again, this is not a prediction. This is just basically looking at, at, at pure data um, and looking at historic correlations between the two. Um, they are relatively tightly correlated and this correlation is now starting to fall apart a little bit, which you know, rings a few warning bells on this side saying like, look, you know, we have to be very, very careful. The probability of the market really coming off very strongly uh, in the near term is, is much higher than it was a year ago. So, um, you know, keeping this in mind, it's good to be prepared for, uh, you know, what happens. So, as I mentioned now, it's likely to get a lot more bumpy than what it has been uh, over recent weeks. I know that you know three or so weeks ago we had quite a strong uh, sell-off on on the equity markets on the S&P 500, and so um, we've had quite a strong recovery since then. However, uh, as we've seen over the last week, uh, markets are starting to get a little jittery once more. So, as highlighted earlier, there are still many many risks, right? Um, generally, looking at historic data, one thing we need, well, we need three things essentially for recessions to rear their heads, which is we need tightening monetary supply, which is you know rising interest rates or, or central banks uh, putting up interest rates. We need a commodity price shock, which I think we've absolutely seen in, in the energy market. We've started seeing it in uh, you know other things like nickel and copper. Uh, there's uh, some evidence that we might have a, co a copper supply shock as well. Um, and then we need runaway inflation. So we need inflation way above what uh, it used to be. And then obviously that, sort of reinforces this tightening monetary policy cycle where we have to control inflation uh, in order to, um, by, by putting up interest rates. So when these things are present, historically, we've, you know, all these things have been present during recession times. So again, it's not necessarily a prediction, uh, but it is sort of just an indicator that we have to be relatively careful of what, what we're doing at this stage, right? So, we need to adapt in order to survive in this new uh, environment and we need to sort of prepare ourselves for the potential that we have um, you know higher volatility aka a market sell-off so what can we do uh, in order to prepare well there are three different types of uh, participants at least non-institutional market participants right so we're not looking at pension funds and hedge funds and uh, you know governments and that kind of stuff we're really looking mostly at the uh, you know, private individuals that are, that are trading markets. So you have investors, swing traders, and day traders. So I suspect that the majority of, of people watching this uh, would fall into the swing traders uh, category. Uh, and the second runner up here would be, would be investors. The day traders are a very small sort of portion of, of the market. Uh, but we have to find ways to adapt um, in order to protect our capital, right? So our, our primary goal here is to protect the capital so that we can live to trade another day. So most of us, you know, across all these three sort of different types of market participants or traders that are out there, uh, you know, a lot of the preparation and a lot of the adaption that we have to do uh, is very similar, um, but there are, you know, obviously a few key differences between those types of uh, different market participants. So we're going to sort of start off with the with the longer term investor, right? So the first thing we can do is we can start to reduce exposure, um, or essentially just increase our our your your, your cash holdings, right? Um, so increasing the or the proportion of cash that you have, or the percentage of cash that you have in your in your total account or in your portfolio, is going to do two things. One, it's going to lower the volatility of your uh, overall portfolio. Uh, it's also going to, you know, you'll have ammunition or dry powder, as the saying goes, so that when the market sells off and gives you a, a solid buy signal, um, that you'd at least then have money to deploy to take advantage of the recovery in the market. Because essentially our goal here is to sidestep the pain and have, uh, you know, money to invest or capital to deploy when the conditions are favorable once more. So we can see that conditions are becoming unfavorable. We want to get out of the way, right? 
Um, so some of the things we can do as longer term investors is we can basically sell out or sell down the stock that are in, in uh, downtrends. So stuff that we want, you know, now is maybe a good time to reconsider those shares. I mean, in general, go through that you've been in for five years. Um, if you are in a losing position, maybe it's time to consider, um, you know, getting out of those stocks until, until conditions get a bit more favorable. Uh, you know, for example, a lot of the tech stocks have been under quite a bit of pressure. Does it still make sense to hold on to these things, particularly for in losing positions? There's an advantage to doing that as well, which is you have nice, uh, you know, tax losses that you can use to reduce your, your, your taxable income. Um, so there is advantage in cutting the losers, right? Uh, I know it is generally painful and, and something that particularly the long-term investors don't like to do. Um, but, you know, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we are in the stocks that when the market sells off, those shares have not sold off as strong. So we've got a nice reference point where, you know, a month ago, three weeks ago, the market sold off really hard. Um, and we can go and have a look at which stocks didn't sell off as hard as the rest of the market. Those are potentially the ones that we want to keep. The ones that sold off, uh, you know, in line with the market or slightly harder than the market, those are potentially stocks that we want to let go of uh, and use, you know, the capital that we free up uh, as the cash portion and in our uh, portfolios, right? So we really sort of just have to really look at, uh, at stuff. So to give you an example, I'll, you know, we run a number of different portfolios for clients. Our local uh, portfolio currently is sitting with something like 20% cash. Our offshore portfolio is also sitting with 20% cash. Um, and then you can see like we've, we've invested primarily sort of in energy, uh, basic materials, and locally we have some inflation linked bonds as well. So we're relatively diversified and we've kept the stocks essentially uh, that have been performing well, and we let go of the stuff that haven't been performing well, right? And this has helped us protect, uh, you know, the, the accounts from from experiencing uh, major drawdown, and um, then taking sort of big losses over the over the last period. So this is a macro thematic approach. So we are, uh, you know, investors of, um, you know, sort of macro themes. So we're trying to figure out, you know, what uh, we think is going to happen in the world in the next two or three years and invest accordingly. Uh, so this approach is ours. Obviously, everyone's is different. There might be some value guys out there. Uh, you know, deep value is a valid fund, uh, you know, an investment strategy, but also, um, you know, just be mindful of how is your stock performing in relation to the index. If the index is down 1% and the stock is down 4 you know, maybe it's time uh, to get out. If, you know, I know there's a lot of people that are, um, you know, big fans of Nusbash, for example, and Process. Those stocks have not been doing really well. Uh, if things get worse, you know, do we really think that these stocks are going to outperform the index if they haven't been doing that in the last couple of years already? Um, you know, if there's a, if there's a large scale sell off, there's probably going to be more pain for them. And you know, I agree that at some point, Nusbash and Process are going to be sort of a generational uh, once in a lifetime opportunity, but I'm not sure that that time is right, you know, just yet. So it's probably better to, you know, bank your tax loss on those things now and, um, you know, wait for an opportunity, even if it means you have to buy it at a higher price, but let's wait for the market to really show us that it wants to trend up again. And at that point we can, we can start to get involved again. Right. Um, so essentially what we, what we're trying to do is we, uh, we want to free up cash in order to deploy when the market recovers. So how do we know when the market recovers? So something that has been relatively reliable over the last, uh, well, I guess since I've discovered it and someone showed it to me, um, it is a very reliable indicator for uh, sort of when the market is bottoming out, uh, is called, it's the VIX term structure. So basically what we're looking at here, and um, just to sort of put as, a, as, a, as an aside note here, um, this is not something that is uh, very hard to find information on. Um, for example, if you have an interactive brokers account, this is something that is available uh, to you, you know, for free on your interactive account. So it is information that is is easily is relatively easy to find. Uh, you don't necessarily need like a Bloomberg terminal or whatever the case is. So what we're doing here is we're measuring volatility over different expiries, right? So volatility 
futures contracts trade like any other futures contract with a, with a, um, with a set expiry. So as you can see on this chart here, what we've got, okay, we've got basically four different lines which, which uh, indicate to us one month ago, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, and one week ago. So the top one here is one month ago, the middle one is three weeks, this uh, second from the bottom is two weeks, and the very bottom one is one week ago, right? Um, so what we're looking at here essentially is if uh, volatility uh, over expected volatility over the next three days, over the next week, over the next two weeks, over the next month, over the next two months, three months, and so on into future until we get to two years in advance. Now, what happens under normal circumstances, so you can see with one week ago, the very bottom one, uh, near-term sort of volatility is expected to be lower than long-term volatility. And this makes a lot of sense to us, right? Because as we go further in time, uh, so, you know, this is, if this is, you know, tomorrow and this is two years from now. So as we go further out in time, predicting what is going to happen becomes more difficult. So of course, implied volatility is a lot higher because it's more difficult to tell what's going to happen, uh, you know, in, in three months or six months or 12 months from now as what it is to tell what's going to happen tomorrow. So tomorrow we can see volatility is expected to be relatively low, but like in a year from now, um, it's a bit less certain. So volatility is just generally higher. So what starts to happen in times of extreme fear and panic, and you know we see strong market sell-offs and that kind of thing, is that uh, like if you look at this from one month ago, which is this top curve, is that near-term volatility starts to become more extreme than long-term volatility. So this term structure starts to invert. So normally you have this curve that sort of starts low in the uh, in the in the near term and moves higher into the long term. Uh, when market is sort of really really in panic mode. Uh, you know, near-term volatility is, is considerably higher than long-term volatility. So as this term structure starts to pick up, you can see here a month ago, um, well, let's do this the opposite way around. So let's say we are here today, right? Uh, then, you know, uh, next week, front uh, near-term volatility starts to pick up. Then the next week, it picks up again. Then by the time we're sort of at the very depths of the sell-off, um, near-term volatility is really, really high. So what we can do is use this as a, as a buy signal, right? So when we see that the VIX term structure is inverted like this, and it starts to flatten, and you see this move that it moves from here down, uh, and near-term volatility starts to dip below long-term volatility again, that's generally a very reliable buy indicator. And if you, you can look at the, you know, a month ago, volatility was extremely high in the near term. And if, the, if you look at what happened to the S&P 500 and even the Aussie, uh, you know, the market came off very, very hard during that time. Uh, now, however, um, well, at least a week ago, uh, near-term volatility was very, very low again, uh, and that term structure had kind of returned to its normal, uh, to its normal configuration, and that um, sort of, you know, is now that the market has been bouncing. So as you see this move down in the space of one week, that near-term volatility really reduced a whole bunch, and um, it sort of dipped below the longer term volatility again, that is your indication to, okay, I need to, I need to get involved. And if you bought S&P 500, for example, um, you know, three weeks ago, you would have had a very, very good run uh, up to about a week ago. So we're looking at uh, a week ago's data. If we look at yesterday and today, this sort of uh, term structure is starting to flatten out again a little bit, which shows us that, look, the market's taking strain and there's a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of panic coming in. So essentially what this is going to be is this is going to be our, our buy indicator for when the dust settles. Like how do we know when to buy and redeploy the capital that we've freed up now? Um, it's going to be when this term structure goes from inverted back to flat and then back to normal, right? Right, okay. So for the swing traders, what we can do, um, and it's really sort of just simple stuff, right? We need to make sure that we trade bigger. I mean, sorry, we trade smaller. Uh, the, the daily ranges on, on shares are gonna be bigger. Uh, so the swings that we see, the, the share price movements that we're gonna see on any given time or on any given day is going to be considerably bigger. So we have bigger percentage moves uh, and therefore we need to reduce the size that we trade and probably widen the stop losses that we use in order to accommodate for this uh, additional velocity. 
I mean, volatility. Um, you know, there are two different ways that we can look at how to manage stop losses. Well, there are, are, are many different ways, but uh, two ones that I like to use. Um, one is a bit more complicated than the other. The one is the ATR times two uh, trailing stop loss methodology. And the other one is a three day low uh, trailing stop. So you can also use a three hour low depending on the time frame that you enter the trade. So if you are, uh, uh, you know, trade off an hourly chart and you want to use three hours, if you trade off a daily chart, you want to use three days. Uh, you know, whatever the case, whatever the period that you're using to do your analysis is, you use three periods prior the low of that period as your as your trailing stop loss. I'll give you an example of how that works uh, in a moment. We just have to remember that, you know, trading really swing trading, particularly day trading, is about survival, right? Um, we need to make sure that we're around to play the game again tomorrow. So drawdown is this unavoidable reality that we can't get away from. Um, but you know, simultaneously, we only really need one or two good, really, really good trades uh, to make our whole year, right? I mean, if you, for example, bought uh, Tungela at 80 Rand, um, you're up 200% on that position, right? So that one trade can really make a big, big difference to your, uh, to your overall profitability. Um, obviously, we need to take, avoid taking risks that we, that we can't afford, and we need to understand the risk that we are, are taking on. Um, also, uh, in one of the previous presentations that I that, that I've done, uh, that you can go look that you can go look at, I suppose, uh, is to build a nice model for yourself that has multiple confirmations, right? So you kind of want uh, one or two momentum indicators, uh, as well as confirmation of trend and maybe a break of resistance, so that you can have uh, you know not just one technical reason, but maybe three or four technical reasons. So let's say, for example, you want it to be an uptrend. You want your stochastic to to move into a bullish configuration. You want your RSI to move into a bullish configuration, and you need the stock to be relatively stronger than the index. Um, all of those things need to be, uh, you know, confirmed before you can take a trade. So you need to be a bit more selective about the trades that you take. Um, I want to just also explain a little bit about how the ATR times I mean, the ATR times two stop loss works. Uh, you know, just for reference sake, I think some people might not have seen the previous uh, presentations on this stuff. So essentially when you enter into a new trade, you, stop, you start with a, with a regular, you know, hard stop loss in accordance with your 2% rule or whatever it is that you're using. Um, and then you can take the ATR reading on the time frame of your entry. So for uh, clarity, like what the ATR is, it's called average true range. It's an indicator that is available on most trading platforms. It basically measures the range that a share trades and it averages that out over a period of 14 days. And then that prints a uh, you know, data point called average true range. Uh, and that plots an oscillator as, a, as an indicator at the bottom of your price chart, right? So generally what you do is you say, okay, cool, ATR multiplied by two, that's where my stop loss is supposed to be. So if your stop loss is uh, you know, at first at a, at a hard stop point, for example, at a, uh, a technical uh, trend change, uh, inflection point on the chart uh, that's where your stop loss is and as the trend as the, the trade moves in your favor um, eventually this ATR times two calculation will start to move your stop loss higher and higher and higher uh, and every day you do this calculation or every hour or whatever the case is you can put yourself a fancy spreadsheet we have one available if you want to download it um, that can show you uh, where your stop loss should be and whether or not you should um, be adjusting it. So as every period passes, every day or hour or whatever your time frame is, the ATR will change, average true range will change, and therefore the distance between the last, the last uh, sort of traded price and where your stop loss should be will also change. So as the market moves in your favor, you only ever move your stop loss higher. Sometimes what will happen is you might see a, a bit of a compression in the trading range that the stock is going through, which will tighten the, the ATR. Um, if that ATR tightens, you can move your stop loss higher. But when there is a big sort of volatile move and the market breaks out, let's say it breaks higher in your favor, you don't necessarily want to be widening your stop loss at any point, right? Um, so, okay, let's get into sort of an example of how this works. So what we have here is, let's say we've got a share price that's kind of trending up and you want to take a short position here, right? Um, 
So when we take a uh, our initial entry into the short trade here at say you know 108 rand um, and eight cents, we're going to put our stop loss at uh, 109, right? Uh, 109 rand 80 cents. So that is where we think, uh, from a technical perspective, our stop loss should be because if it goes above 109.80, then we can say the trend is is on its way up again, right? So the risk we're taking here is essentially 87 or 86 cents. And our ATR at this point is also, or ATR times two also works out to uh, 86 cents. So then as the market sort of comes down uh, in our favor, we want to be able to trail our stop loss lower. So as this, the market sort of comes down here, our ATR keeps dragging down, dragging down stop loss until eventually the market turns and we take our, our stop loss there. So in a sense, we necessarily have to put a target on this trade. Uh, we can only use our ATR times two as our indication to get out of the trade. So as the market sort of goes down uh, and volatility might increase in the stock, ATR might increase, which will mean that our ATR stop loss gets wider. But as long as price is moving in our favor and we're only ever moving the stop loss if it moves in our favor, we should be able to trail that down quite well to a point where eventually this, the, the trend changes and we and we get out, right? Um, another example here would be, uh, you know, here we have a situation where, um, you know, this trend doesn't necessarily change, but our ATR stop loss drags us all the way down to here. Our stop loss sits here. It doesn't necessarily break higher. It continues to trade down. And at some point we have a situation where ATR starts to compress. So as this market sort of flattens out again, uh, ATR starts to compress. This uh, ATR times two calculation now comes to a much smaller number. Uh, if we have a breakout higher, we know where to stop. If we have a breakout lower, uh, our, our ATR uh, stop loss, you know, trails down again. So this is a very nice way to do this. Okay, this is an example with a short position, but it's a very nice way to make sure that we stay in the trades that are winning, and we get out of them uh, at you know at the most favorable uh, possible time. Uh, another method is the uh, three day or three period uh, low. So a good example here is, is Tungela Resources. We had a nice little breakout here. Uh, essentially all you're doing, and this is just really keeping it extremely simple, is you're saying, okay, cool, this is today's candle, yesterday's candle, three days ago, the low price on that candle is our stop loss. So today's, uh, you know, tomorrow we'll move our stop loss up now to 220 to sit at the low of that candle and if we break, lower than we, uh, you know, below that level, then we stop out. Otherwise, we just let this trade run. There's no real, um, there's no real reason to make any adjustments, uh, you know, to our position. There's no real reason to have us take profit on this trade. We can just let it run until we get trail stopped out. So this is a very nice way. I think at least it's my preferred way of, of, of uh, managing risks and or stop losses and targets and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then lastly, looking at the intraday trading stuff, I mean, the rules are fairly similar to uh, that of the swing trader, you know, very much um, just reduce your positions, be uh, a, bit more, a bit more mindful that, that stocks can move a lot higher. The real superpower that you have here is that you're not holding overnight positions, so you get to start every day uh, afresh. So there's none of that sort of overnight position holding stress. Um, and it's just, you know, whatever methodology has been working for you, don't really change it. Uh, you know, volatility can be a great opportunity for you to, to uh, as an intraday trader, because if the moves are bigger, obviously you can make a, a slightly larger profits, but you need to also be a little bit more, more patient with how your, um, you know, when you take your profits and, you know, if things are moving a lot, then you might want to sit in your trades a little longer to give them a bit more time. And this is where a trailing stop loss uh, will be a bit more helpful. So essentially, you know, the, the major rule here, and I'm going to reiterate this again, is you have to protect your capital at all costs. So the primary thing that we want to do uh, is to make sure that the shares that we are, if we're investors, that we are invested in are, are still the stocks that we want to be in and to have you know, solutions that we are not free up some cash. And then when we see uh, a solid buy signal looking at something like the VIX term structure, that is when we want to re-enter and 